welcome and thank you for joining us. We've got Doggy, uh, Dr. Sorry, Dr. Maggie Bjorkesamis uh, from uh, Namibia, and her colleague joining us today, Mr. Andre Yuban, and they are both working at the Center for Open Distance and E-Learning, CODEL, at the University of Namibia. So Maggie's got a lot of experience in ICT-related subjects and library and information science. Got a really interesting um, background, serving as head of department and director, and I know she's been a chairperson of eLearning Africa and um, an ICT steering committee of the Ministry of Education in Namibia. Really, really fascinating um, bio. And Andre has years of work experience in advertising and multimedia workflows. He's currently the coordinator of digital media at CODEL. And Andre and his team are tasked with the campus-wide rollout of Panopto, which is a lecture capture software which allows lecturers to record content for their courses uh, anywhere at any time. I'm going to share the link uh, for folks who might want to read their full bios. But I won't keep you waiting any longer. Over to you, Maggie. Oh, thank you very much. Um, uh, shall we say good afternoon? Because with us it's noon, but uh, of course um, in other areas it, it's lunch hour already, and even in other areas uh, two two p.m. and so on. So perhaps we should say good afternoon, colleagues. Let me also allow Andre to 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 say his greetings, and then we can actually proceed. But thank you very much for the opportunity to present to the image uh, colleagues today. Um. Hi everyone, I hope you can hear me. Um, thanks so much for having us, and we're looking forward to actually getting through this presentation with you all. Yeah, that's me. Let's go, Maggie. Okay, on that note, I think, colleagues, we are more than ready to share the contents and the discussion around our presentation with you today. And um, as you can see from our topic, we would like to approach this in terms of the innovative pedagogical approaches for blended learning at the University of Namibia with specific emphasis of the flipped classroom model that we have been researching and, and trying to implement within the University of Namibia's context. So as you can see on our background slide in terms of outlining the presentation, uh, we are going to attempt in this presentation, uh, hopefully not to bore you down, uh, but to keep you interested in terms of our discussion where we are going to focus a bit in terms of the background to blended learning at UNAM, the conceptualizing of blended learning at UNAM, uh, twofold in terms of ICT integration in teaching and learning, but also defining the blend and why we opted for blended learning um, at the University of Namibia. And then most importantly, in terms of the flipped classroom, which is what the crux of the presentation will be, a, will be about, and also the benefits of the flipped classroom um, for our full-time students as well as our distance mode students at the University of Namibia. Then Andre will share with you the practical side of this in terms of our implementation strategy, what we have tried and tested so far, whether it's working or not. We will then share with you some of the opportunities and challenges in our opinion and some future strategies for our flipped classroom to continue um, to work within the University of Namibia's context and, and then just some concluding remarks. So we hope um, this will bring something across to you that will be valuable in terms of our discussion here today. So in terms of uh, our introduction for this presentation, as we already alluded to through the outline, is that uh, the strategic implementation of e-learning at the University of Namibia is recent in our opinion, reason being that um, the Center for E-Learning and Interactive Multimedia, which was referred to as CELEM, uh, was is, is very recent because it was only established in 2015. But it's also safe to say for me at this stage that prior to the formal establishment of such a center at the University of Namibia, which happened only in 2015, we have been trying various ways and means 
of implementing e-learning, training our staff, building capacity in this area. So that all happened a bit more on an ad hoc basis, but we, we still started it. But since 2015, it's really been systematic and strategic in terms of its implementation. But then one year down the line, after the Center for e-learning and interactive multimedia, we were then merged for this with the Center for External Studies, and we are now called the Center for Open Distance and e-learning, and that happened all beginning of 2016. Uh, and the Center for External Studies uh, was mandated in the university to deal with all the uh, distance learning mode programs of the university. And now we have merged the ODL side of things with the E side of things, hence the name Center for Open Distance and e-learning. And uh, also through the name, we are actually an academic support center, and our mandate is specifically to support all our faculties in the university to be able to deliver their programs on distance mode and a bit of, of, of things online as well, hence our decision to go for a blend. Uh, we are also tasked with implementing e-learning strategies uh, to support both the distance mode students as well of, uh, as our full-time students in this regard. Um, we have got an e-learning policy that was approved way back uh, in 2013, just when we started to, you know, ponder with the idea of establishing a formal center for e-learning within the university. And we are basically guided through this policy in all our endeavors and our actions in this regard. So as you can see on our current slide, our responsibilities as per policy is that we need to investigate continuously the different technology enhanced learning methods available for both our on and off campus students, referring specifically to off campus students as our distance mode students. We are also need to assist lecturers in continuous planning, designing and implementation of their e-learning courses through approved delivery systems. Uh, we are training and supporting our lecturers in the use of not just ad hoc or um, you know supplementary use of ICTs, but rather more effective use of ICTs within their teaching and learning. We also need to maintain support and encourage the adoption of, of the online e-learning environment within the institution and other aspects as well, because I'm sure you are all uh, familiar with the fact that introducing such a new concept in terms of e-learning adoption in the form of a blended approach is new to such an environment. So we are continuously also involved in uh, mindset, you know, changing strategies, change management principles in terms of how we can make this more acceptable to our academic community within the university. Uh, and we have been quite successful in that regard, even though I must say it myself. So in terms of conceptualizing blended learning uh, at the university, we are trying to do that uh, twofold, as I already mentioned during the outline, uh, specifically with reference to ICT integration and then in terms of defining the blend. In terms of ICT integration in teaching and learning, we are guided with the, by the SMR SAMAR model of Puentendura. And the reason for that is, and I'm not going to go into details because you can see the model in front of you, and I'm familiar, or I'm aware that most of you could be familiar with this particular model, but it's been the one that guided us in our practices, in our decision making for opting for the blended learning approach with specific emphasis on the on the flipped classroom. So what we are doing with the model in terms of how it relates to us and how we are using it, um, at the enhancement level, before we have established the Center for Open Distance and E-Learning, lecturers, as I'm sure is also currently happening in other universities within the region, mainly focused on utilizing ICT, um, meaning that they were just using PowerPoint presentations and digital notes, and they were doing those um, on the portal within the university. And that was merely just, uh, as per the model, to, to substitute and at best even augment their traditional teaching methods. But what we are doing at the moment, because this is more important to us in terms of the transformation level of the model, is that Cordial is now trying to support our lecturers to integrate ICTs in order to transform in a more meaningful way their practices. In other words, to modify and redefine their teaching 
rather than just in, in the previous way where, where they just used ICTs and integrated it as a simple substitute for their old methods. But um, um, one way or another, one can actually see that we lecturers were already wittingly or un, um, uh, knowingly sort of attempting to use a blend in their classes because they were able to use these lecture notes and, and digital notes uh, on the portal, but not really in terms of what the blend can assist us with until the formal establishment of Salem and then after the merger now um, Cordial. So continuing again in terms of how we conceptualizing this blend within the University of Namibia, we are defining the blend in that we are uh, governed by the definition, as you can see, um, by trying to benefit from both, both the face-to-face -face as well as the online learning aspects in terms of how we are looking at the blend. As you can see from the definition that we are using in the slides, um, it is in terms of the teaching and learning environments where there is an effective, and this is the important and crux of the matter for us, the opportunity to integrate different modes of, of delivery in terms of modes of teaching and styles of learning as a result of adopting a strategy and systematic approach to the use of technology combined with both features of face-to-face -face interaction. So that's basically it for us and that's why um, and that's why um, uh, we are trying to 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 benefit from from the blend in this regard. I'm just trying to establish whether we are still together. Hello. Hi, Maggie. We are. Okay. Um, I'm just uh, okay. putting a little note here in the text chat for folks saying that I'll be collecting questions. So feel free to type your questions in the text chat, and then Maggie, when you have a moment, um, then then we'll come back to the questions. But for now, you you proceed with your presentation. Thanks. Okay, no, 100%. We also feel comfortable with that. If the questions are collected for us, then we can just trying to go through in terms of what we want to share with you, and then we can engage in terms of the discussions a little bit later. So that was the other reason in terms of how we conceptualize the blend at the university by defining um, the blend in that way in terms of benefiting from both face-to-face -face as well as online activities. But I'm also sure that we are familiar it's simply because of the environment that we operate in, sometimes limited bandwidth, restricted bandwidth, and as today in terms of Murphy's Law that's at play here, every day we've been working <laughs> and having, having had webinars across the world and had no connection issues. And just today, as we now wanted to engage, we had a bit of a, a technical glitch on this side. But uh, uh, needless to say, that is the reason why the university could not opt for full e-learning implementation, but rather considering the blended model to allow us to basically just complement what our academic staff members are doing within their face-to-face -face classes uh, with a bit of the some of the um, added value opportunities of the of the online part. So now we are moving to trying to, to basically explain why we decided on blended learning, and I've already touched on that in terms of what I just um, referred to of limitations in ICT integration competence um, and wide access to digital devices and the internet. Therefore, the blended learning approach enabled a measured implementation of e-learning for us while we are able to maintain our face-to-face -face sessions as well. Also, academics were not yet prepared in terms of mindset and, and readiness in terms of digital competencies to move completely over to full-fledged e-learning, hence the reason why we opted for the blend. But not only that, we also realized that blended learning provided us the opportunity for a paradigm shift within the university where the aspects of online learning could be introduced to our students' learning environment without also demanding too much from our students in terms of self-regulated learning at this point in time. Even though you'll see later on in our presentation that um, by using the flipped classroom, you are actually expecting the students to, you know, to engage in, in a bit of self-paced and self-regulated learning. But with our support, we, we, we kind of getting there. Lecturers were also already, as I said, practicing blended learning without really noticing it because uh, they had the face-to-face -face sessions and had the opportunity to upload their presentations onto the portal. The only uh, challenging aspect for us in that regard was that 
lecturers often opt, and you'll see this when we talk about our opportunities and challenges, to basically just have bulleted points within their presentations and could never really elaborate. And um, now, in particular, after our merger with the distance mode students that we are dealing with, that is particularly for us a pedagogical challenge because the only way in which you are facilitating the learning of a distance mode student is through more elaboration in terms of uh, what you are sharing with the, the, the on-campus or residential students and hence our decision also to go for the flipped classroom concept because now we can add either audio uh, you know, voiceovers onto PowerPoint presentations or we can video record the lecturers in terms of making that a more valuable experience for our distance mode students. So on our next slide, as you can see, we are still trying to define why we opted for the flipped classroom concept as the university, at the University of Namibia. We have done considerable research in this area. We are guided, as you can see, by the flipped learning network as well as by the University of Queensland in terms of the pedagogical process involved in the flipped learning and flipped classroom concept. But um, we're also guided by the Horizon report and, and the Khan Academy in terms of what they are doing and how they are testing this out. Um, as well as, interestingly enough, you'll see when Andre will engage with you, um, we have also a memorandum of understanding with Cardiff University in the UK and um, we've also been supporting them in the use of Panopto to practice the flipped classroom here at the University of Namibia. So we have a bit of a case study in that um, regard as well. But most importantly, one of the biggest reasons why we opted for the flipped classroom concept is also because um, we found it the most appealing as a first sort of strategic approach from our side as Cordial uh, and as a newly established e-learning center to assist our academic fraternity and also to advocate for the importance still of pedagogy and not so much the importance of technology. Because the moment you mention that you are from an e-learning center, people often think that you know technology is more important and that we would just want to push and drive for technology integration. But um, it's important for us to actually at this point make it crystal clear as we are making to our academics on a daily basis that for us, the pedagogical side of this is equally important. The technology is just there to add on and to add value. So we are continuously you know, advocating for this. Um, also continuing on terms of why we opted for the flipped classroom in terms of the dynamics of our various students, which I'm sure these environments are also familiar to, to most of us as part of this um, webinar today, is that the learning environment for our full-time students um, is definitely characterized by large class sizes at the moment, where the predominant method of instruction, you know, as we said before, is lecture presentations. Lecturers will then spend hours on end reading through those presentations during their lectures. And for us, the biggest challenge here is that we are not really moving in terms of the hierarchy of, of Bloom's taxonomy because we, we are not yet triggering you know, deeper learning opportunities with, with our students. Uh, and then again, the lecturers are using the same notes and then they share them with the students on the portal. So as a result, the students will lose interest in attending classes at the same time because the PowerPoints are accessible to them. So we needed to think about this uh, in terms of what opportunity can we get from these challenges within our current environment. Uh, also with specific reference to the rationale for our distance students is that uh, for the distance environment, our learning is uh, characterized by limited, and that is very limited face-to-face -face contact between students and lecturers. Our distance students only meet their lecturers twice a year. Uh, over a one-week period, and that's only during vacation school sessions. And many a times, because distance mode students by nature are working, you know, parents and, and so on, it's also difficult for them to then take time out from their, you know, employment um, and come for these vacation schools. So we need to continuously assess and evaluate and research and see and strategize in terms of what can work best for our distance mode students. 
Also for the distance mode students, the main learning resources have been so far only the traditional print-based study guides and lecture notes that will then be availed on the learning portal, but with little to no explanation for their understanding. Uh, so hence um, our reason for looking into alternative strategies like the flipped classroom to assist them better. Um, these, these notes that we are also talking about are normally designed for the residential students in mind. So our distance students are always, you know, not getting the full package in terms and as I said before, it makes this very pedagogically cha challenging for our distance mode students because a PowerPoint with only bullet points and no explanatory notes or details. you know, doesn't really uh, become appealing to them or even assist them in terms of enriching their learning process. So we are moving to some of the benefits that we have observed over the time frame in terms of uh, practicing and implementing our flipped classroom concept uh, in that access to the videos before the class time seems to be allowing for efficient use of your class time because as the flipped classroom allows you to record these lectures and then upload them to the learning management system. Students have access to these prior to the class time and our idea is uh, encouraging the lecturers to then use the class time for more engagement and, 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 and interactivity in terms of quizzes and case studies in terms of, as I said, triggering deeper learning than just the superficial level at, at which we operated before. But also, as, as, as the second um, uh, picture indicates, more active learning opportunities for students are actually availed through using the flipped classroom concept because we, we can trigger higher order discussions, which will then trigger deep, deeper learning within the classes. There's also increased one-on-one -on -one interaction between the students and the lecturers because now that the students have the notes beforehand and the video clips, and they can go through all this, they can then interact with the lecturers on, on, on the learning management system um, as well um, in this regard. It also enhances the student's responsibility for learning. You know, gone are the days that the students can just blame, you know, lecturers or, uh, you know, the huge class sizes and things like that. Uh, we are also encouraging and, and, and continuously advocating that our students should take responsibility for their own learning. And we, we, we were thinking, what better way of, of using the flipped classroom to assist our students with this? Because they now really need to get into the mindset of, of self-regulated learning. And most importantly for us is that the flipped classroom concept that we've tested and tried it so far definitely caters for multiple learning styles of our students and that that is a big plus for us as well but in terms of the expected benefits for our distance students um, the, the flipped allow, uh, flip classroom concept allows us to add on to these predominantly you know old-fashioned study guides that we still sent by a snail mail to our students in that we can now also add value for our students in this regard by having the, the videos on the learning management system for our distance mode students as well. One of the, the other initiatives that, that we have gone for uh, start of this semester was that we have made a shift in terms of the traditional way of assignment submission of our distance mode students. They used to drop it in a box hard copy format and from, from last semester we have gone completely online in terms of having online assignment submissions through our learning management system and then they have access to all these resources in terms of audio files or video files that they can access in the form of podcasts or, or vodcasts as well. And then we, we also realized that the benefits to our distance students is that it creates a student virtual access to the lecturer who they hardly meet because as I said before, they have got this opportunity only twice a year, and sometimes it's so difficult for them to come to the vacation school. So now with this, they are at least able to also interact with their lecturers virtually, and we, we make use of, of um, video conferencing software as a third-party service um, in Moodle where the lecturers can then also connect instantaneously with their students irrespective of the place and where they are from. It also, in our opinion, re that classroom feel for our distance students 
for learning by breaking this distance barrier because they feel kind of more in touch with their lecturers. It, it also helps us um, in terms of using this flip classroom that where students are struggling with challenging topics in various disciplines and subject matters, we encourage such lecturers to then come and they are then recorded and we, we upload these explanations in terms of additional tutorial support to our distance mode students. And it, it would appear that students are really, you know, benefiting from this. There's also sufficient research in terms of the flipped classroom uh, that, uh, that indicates that, you know, performance can improve through this method. And we are very excited and we are really waiting towards the end of this year to carry out a survey. Uh, we've started with a small case study, as you'll see later on, when Andre will present in this regard already, but we would like to do a, full, a full-scale survey in terms of also establishing from our distance mode students and see whether there is, you know, any sort of indication in that regard that it does improve performance. Um, the delivery of video lessons also enable face-to-face -face contact to be more meaningful, as I said, um, for those that cannot make it during vacation schools, and it offers our lecturers the opportunity to anticipate uh, to address anticipated and real challenges uh, um, learning challenges of our students in, in just instead of just the blah 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 that we get the opportunity for during vacation schools or in face to face sessions so now we would just like to move over in terms of some of those um, uh, opportunities and, and and challenges that we think um, that you know um, we experience in terms of this blended approach through the flipped classroom. In terms of the of the opportunities for for blended learning at UNAM, we notice that that students are are bored by long lectures of PowerPoint presentations. Uh, that's receptive to new um, innovations. Oh, I I think I just um, I just skipped a bit ahead in terms of opportunities and challenges, and I and I didn't allow my partner to come <laughs> in with his with his practical part. But I'll quickly give Andre a chance to just uh, sort of elaborate in terms of his part of the presentation where he needs to come in with our implementation experience and then we'll move on again with the rest of the presentation. So Andre, over to you and apologies for that glitch. Not a problem, not a problem. <laughs> um, can everyone hear me? Just, uh, just, okay, I think everyone can hear me. All right, great. So the way we went about approaching the lectures was basically by um, going to the faculty heads or um, deans and asking them to submit people's names or at least three lecturers names that um, would be willing to do um, the recordings for us. So from each faculty we basically approached three people. Um, they then became part of our our greater um, group known as the um, what is the term again Maggie? Pilot group? Pilot group, yes. So we so we use them as a pilot pilot group. Um, we would then set up um, scheduled um, recording times for these individuals, and they would then obviously, um, abiding to their their schedules, make um, bookings for the recordings to be taken place. Most of the presentations that we recorded um, were done uh, the normal style. If, if by normal style, I would say um, a stationary camera that we set up inside the studio so that the lecturer could present on a board. Or, uh, and most of them were delivered through uh, projector and PowerPoint presentation at that point in time. Um, as an addition, we also added the flip chart in case a lecturer wanted to write, um, especially when it comes to algebra, um, physics, any equations that needed to be written down, the lecturer could then write down. And then we would use a, a, a two camera setup where one would capture what's being written on the board and then the, the other one would capture the presenter being presented uh, or, or presenting at that point in time. Um, to access these recordings, we obviously gave the students their own login uh, on the LMS system, it's the, um, the um, learning management system. Uh, we use Moodle. And um, once they've logged in, they can see all the courses that they are basically registered in for the semester. and. Um, when they enter that, that section, they can actually go into the video um, section and see all the videos that are available to them. So um, that's basically how students then accessed the, the information that was available. We also try to keep um, the lecturers in um, or make, it a, make them aware of the fact that lectures sometimes go longer than 45 minutes. And 
keeping st students attached to a screen for 45 minutes could sometimes be a difficult task. So we are we basically um, assisted them in creating shorter versions of um, their, le their lectures and just giving students specific information that was needed. All right, I'm going to take you to the next slide, which is um, the flipped classroom lecture recordings and pictures. Basically, what this is is just a, a couple of images of um, the recordings that were made. Um, you can see the two examples that we have there is the present presentation taking place, the top picture, and then the bottom picture is the person using or the lecturer using the flip chart to actually sh um, explain history to his students. Um, the picture on the on the right, the far right, is basically our um, LMS system, and you can see if you look closely that this person is logged in and he's taking part in the, the world history course. So you can see his videos and these videos have been basically able to download and um, enlarge the image as it is right there. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so the implementation of Panopto. So we already gathered the idea that we've got a, a pilot group that was already active in recording videos. It was difficult. Some people would, would conform to the idea and become, um, how do I say, um, leaders in, 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 in the recording field. <laughs> so they would go out and try and advocate for us. But um, uh, with, the, with the launch of Panopto, which is actually a very, 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 very cool um, um, software, at Panopto, let me just give a little bit of background on Panopto. Panopto is a lecture capture software which allows video and uh, audio streaming. You can stream, you can webcast with it, or you can record any way that you would like like to record. You don't need to have a um, internet connection. You don't have to be online. Um, and these get then made available to your students through Moodle. So lecturers would then basically approach us the same way they did in the previous um, setup. Um, they would um, contact us and we would then um, schedule times for them. Um, we actually uh, created a, a training session for them as well. So they would get a hands-on feel to on how to actually use the software and how to go about assisting themselves in case they wanted to record at a, at a different venue from the, this university or, or if, if they want to just make a short recording at home, they could then basically do that. And Panopto is available for Android devices. It's available for um, Mac uh, OS devices. Um, and laptops, tablets, etc. All right, so let's go a little bit further into the training. So we, we basically then created the training calendar for, for academics. As we all know, academics are uh, very um, busy people during the day. So we tried to slot them in according to whenever they had the available time to, to come to our presentations. And then we um, basically just made the content available on um, Moodle as well. So I think that's uh, okay. Yeah. So in the training, we 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 made them create a little video. They basically then went in and edited edit edited it themselves, and they shared it with peers as well. And Moodle is very very I mean, I mean Panopto is very very good in the sense that you can share content with your colleagues, and they can give inputs to where you could have maybe changed something or where you could have maybe um, added some more information. You can also add video inside Moodle. I mean, Panopto as well in a recording. Okay, so the next slide, I would like to show you some of the pictures that we've, these are, these are just pictures of training that took place. Um, up, up to, up to, to, to today, um, we've recorded 360 videos for lecturers, or lecturers that actually recorded themselves, um, 360 videos. And at the far image on the right is we've, um, lecturers being trained, and we've trained about 111. I'm not sure if this is the accurate number uh, or the correct number because I'm pretty sure we've done maybe 125 to this point in time. Um, yes, so we that's, are. That's what that is that on your slide. case study? Um, the slide. That I will be presenting a slide that if says you do see it there. And this is basically just a case study that was done by. If you want to can everyone see the forward? case study that was done by the University of Cardiff? Hello? Are we still together? Yeah. 
All right, uh, so the, next, the next slide after that is basically the case study of the use of Panopto in teaching. So this was a case study that was basically done by the University of Cardiff. Um, they did some background. Uh, well, at the School of Pharmacy, they are using Panopto um, greatly in, in the recording. And I see that when we're going through this, the presentation, you don't actually see this slide. Don't know how this happened, but okay. Nevertheless, I'm just going to give you some of the details that was inside the um, the case study that was um, done by I think it's Professor Judy Hall, or Dr. Judy Hall. Yes. Um, so the results were it was belief. The results were it was very beneficial for the participants prior to exams, which meant that they actually could do proper revision. Uh, the, the nice thing about having video content available is students can always go back and revisit uh, a particular lecture that, that took place. So now they have the opportunity to actually do that. Um, and then they also have, they learn at their own pace. So basically what that means is they can just sit back, um, not sit back, but when they are learning, they are learning according to the, 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 the speed and capabilities that they might have. Um, they also did a little test on the, the, the difficulty that people may have experienced with the software or accessing the lectures. And the feedback that they got was that 78% of people said no, they did not have any technical issues or they did not have any problems accessing the videos. And then 22% said yes. But I, I think that's very minimal in consideration. So I'm going to hand over back to Maggie. Thank you very much for your, this opportunity. And uh, Maggie, let's yeah. go. No, thank you, Andre, for sharing our actual implementation experience uh, at the University of Namibia in terms of the flipped classroom concept. I've just realized that um, the PowerPoint that you've shared now on our backup device um, is not the PDF that we've shared where we've added the case study, uh, but that's still okay. We can still later on share that with the with the community, and we just thought it interesting in terms of this particular study that was carried out specifically using uh, Panopto um, in teaching and where we uh, did this jointly with Cardiff University in, in our School of Pharmacy, as, as um, Andre uh, pointed out. And for us, what was pleasing is really the, the, the big percentage uh, in terms of 78% of the students that actually confirmed that they didn't find it difficult to, to use the lectures that were recorded in this way or to even access them in, uh, through the LMS um, in this regard. So that was a big plus. And as I said, this was just a small study on one of, of, of our um, uh, student groups, but we would like to carry out a more substantive one towards the end of this year. So it takes us now to the opportunities and challenges that we wanted to share with you as well. And in terms of the opportunities, um, I'm sure we are all familiar that uh, students are definitely very receptive to new innovations, and therefore they were taking on to this uh, idea of us uh, naturally, even though our focus was more on capacitating our academics, uh, we also had to focus uh, on our students in terms of, of their skill set, and, and they were really very receptive to, to, to this as a new innovation within the University of Namibia. But not only just that, it's also because video just naturally has this sort of entertainment appeal, making it easier to engage our students and uh, they seem to be taking on quite naturally to this as well. Um, our students mostly have access to laptops or tablets or mobile phones in the form of specifically smartphones. Um, in terms of the opportunity why we decided to go for this strategy, uh, wireless is available freely across all our 12 campuses uh, in the University of Namibia, but not only that, um, students are also uh, provided with a 3G or 4G dongle because they pay a technology fee as part of their registration fee and then the university would then avail these 3G or 4G dongles to them. So this also assisted us in moving in this dire direction, knowing that students you know, were not challenged in terms of their internet access to be able to access the, 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 the content once it has been recorded using Panopto. 
and also because the university's goal, as it is for any university, is to improve the quality of our learning. So the flipped classroom, we found, naturally contributes to assist us in improving the quality of learning. But then it's also important for us to have a balanced view in terms of, of our approach and our activities. And uh, so therefore, um, we need to also focus on the challenges of, of the blended learning through the flipped classroom classroom concept that we have implemented within the university. And we have discovered that it, it still remains a challenge because um, it requires advanced levels of, of self-regulated and self-paced learning on the student side. And it takes a while for them, even though it's appealing, even though they're naturally inclined in terms of wanting to use this, as, you know, um, considering their age and, and, and the whole concept of um, of, of, of the natives and so on and the immigrants, uh, but of course uh, still challenging in terms of their higher order level thinking skills, skills even though they so naturally inclined to use of devices. And uh, another challenge is that flip learning also assumes that our students' home environments are conducive to learning, but that is not always the case. And therefore we also need to keep an open mind as Cordell in how we can cater for our students with, with um, you know, problematic environments where they cannot really uh, uh, focus on their learning. And, and within the center, we, we then avail such um, spaces to our students. Also, video lectures that are not accompanied by learning activities, you know, and just be standalone, they simply become boring as lectures at home as well. So um, therefore, our approach there must also, you know, be very specific in how to become appealing. The cost, as we all know, of accessing your digital devices, whether it's internet or whether it's, you know, the concept of the digital divide, we are not saying that that disappeared overnight. It still remains a real reality. We still remain a developing, you know, a developing context with which in which we are working. But we are also, you know, saying to ourselves that um, we need to also move into the 21st century in terms of some of our teaching and pedagogical methods that we want to use within the university. The flip learning is also a culture that requires, uh, requires time to be cultivated in terms of, of for it to flourish within the university. That's why we were so happy when we did the small study with the School of Pharmacy and their students to realize that at least some of the students are already very positive and provided positive feedback in terms of their experiences with accessing the recorded videos through the use of Panopto. So we are almost there in terms of our future strategies that we've pondered about and that we are thinking about in terms of the university in that we would like to continue to support our students to develop self-regulated learning competencies and habits in order to ensure commitment to own learning. This, this will still take us a while, but it's something that we are cognizant of and that we are willing to go the extra mile to support our students. Also, developing these lectures in terms of video pedagogy to create short and chunked videos with engaging learning activities. As Andre explained to you, when we initially started with the idea of the flipped classroom, when we just did the traditional way of recording, um, it becomes really a challenge in terms of the file sizes and also in terms of the concentration of the students if you would record an entire 45-minute lecture. So there again, we needed to rethink a bit. And of course, with the acquiring of Panopto as our, our video conferencing soft, um, our video capturing software, we realized that it would be better if we go for bite-sized learning, you know, so that we get to more uh, smaller chunks of these videos and students, and it can be, you know, have a better appeal to our students in that regard. And our lecturers are also open to that. Um, also, um, to explore alternatives to bend with a hungry files, as we all know, with video, that's definitely the case. So, um, and also, not all lecturers are comfortable in being video recorded. So the beauty of Panopto is that you can also just add a voice over over your PowerPoints in terms of explaining a bit more detail. So we are looking at alternatives that all the time in terms of, you know, reducing file sizes and, and, and also to assist lecturers who are not comfortable in front of a, a camera and so on. Then uh, one of our ideas is also to create internet-rich e-learning spaces across our camp campuses. As we said, we already have uh, Wi-Fi available, but we would like to have more Wi-Fi hotspots across our, our campuses, which would then assist and promote 
video content consumption among our students. And then, uh, most definitely, support strategies to incentivize our lecturers that are willing to come to the party and that are willing to invest their time to create these online learning resources uh, in the form of video files. We, we are continuously looking into that as well because we, we feel that they're really going the extra mile, you know, in terms of this regard. Then to conclude, folks, basically from our experience we have learned, as, as, as I'm sure you are all aware, technology alone would not change pedagogy or um, alter a well-established teaching and learning habits. So we need to think of, of other approaches as well in terms and strategies in terms of how to tackle this. Hence, implementation of blended learning in a traditional university like ours requires an understanding of change management as well as patience, um, which made us realize that it's also important for us to keep an open mind and rather focus on working with the willing. You know, it, it won't take us far if this must look like a forced, you know, or an imposed strategy on our academic fraternity. So basically, our concept is, as Andre already explained, to invite uh, a colleagues through their deans, uh, they are nominated, but also just those that are walking in and show a keen interest in terms of using technology to integrate it in their teaching and learning uh, um, on a daily basis. So we want to work with the willing. We have uh, the, the pilot group actually became our champion group because we are continuously working with them as well to advocate these services across our 12 campuses at the university. A small and incremental approach to blended learning is more cost effective. That is what we have realized. It's, it's not about scale in the beginning. It's about taking some baby steps and then getting to, to the scalability that you would need at the end of the day and more likely then allow us to succeed in the long run continuing with this approach and strategy. It's also extremely important for us to document our achievements and also all the challenges that we are experiencing as we are going along, uh, Thank which you very is much, uh, in, in terms of uh, very we, crucial for us to uh, measure our progress that we have made, and also just to enable us um, to uh, uh, newer approaches when things are, stay, are failing because stay, of this constant um, back and forth Maggie, evaluation and mon so? monitoring in terms of whether things are working or not. Colleagues, I believe that that was a mouthful. We've literally okay, almost wonderful. used the thank whole you. hour um, for the you. actual you delivery of the presentation and we would at least tell really uh, you know entertain know some questions in this regard but once again answer, thank you very uh, much for the opportunity to uh, share this with you and we hope um, there'll be more such opportunities in future thank you um, fee. students have wi-fi and all of that um, there was i think overlapping questions between irene and gabriel irene wanted to know um, about the kind of investment you put in place uh, to enable this integration. Yes, 100%. Yes. Yes, yes. No problems with us. At least for a, for another 10 minutes, we can address some Not questions. Not just the investment, but how was it done? Over time, or was it all at once? How long did it take? I think maybe that that's the first question. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. No, not a, not a problem at all. Yeah. No, as as you rightfully said, I think we did address the 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 question in terms of students' access and so on, in terms of their devices that they have access to, but also the fact that uh, the wireless, you know, spaces and hotspots across our twelve campuses that they can use when they are on campus, but also the advantage of the technology fees that they are paying as part of their registration fee, then they have access to the 3G and 4G dongle. So that, that's that question, uh, as you said, we've addressed that already. But in terms of the investments we've put in place so far to achieve this over time and how long it took us, as I, 
as I explained, um, we've, all of this is, is fairly new for us. We basically started in, in 2015 with all of this, even the uh, recording prior to uh, traditional recording prior to uh, moving to a more professional software like Panopto assisting us in video capturing, uh, which also renders flexibility that lecturers can record themselves either online and then when they reach an, uh, you know, an internet enabled environment, it automatically loads uh, it onto the system. But they can do all of this online from the comfort of their homes while cooking and so on. So these are the, the advantages and the benefits. But in terms of the investments on our side, of course it takes time. As I said, it's now yeah. basically a year and a half that we are practicing this. Um, uh, we have a full-fledged digital media team and I must say, um, on their side, they are, you know, putting a lot of effort in in terms of going out. Uh, they're not just recording uh, formal lectures per se, but they're also recording other events within the university as well. And so they are putting a lot of time and effort in that regard. Um, we actually advocate for more open source, you know, yeah. uh, software within the university. And therefore, in terms of Moodle and all the third party software that we are integrating there, you'll find we are using Mahara as an open source software for uh, um, e-portfolios and so on. We are using Big Blue Button as our uh, video conferencing and several others. Um, so, so we more sort of advocating for that. But in the case of Panopto, we really researched the value of going for a proprietary software like Panopto. And um, it does cost us an arm and a leg, but the advantage <laughs> of, uh, you know, this investment is that um, because of the partnership with Cardiff University and the fact that they have used Panopto in their environment before, they assisted us in terms of negotiating for a considerable reduced amount in paying for the software. That's not Panopto itself yeah. as a proprietary software. And actually, in the end, first they negotiated for a fairly reduced amount, and once uh, you know they managed the reduced amount, they also went 50-50 with us in actually paying the actual fee for Panopto. But um, because we are constantly thinking of how we will sustain this, you know, when finances, finances are dwindling within our academic environments, we have um, discussed the idea within our e-learning uh, part of the, of the center that we should approach our other universities you know, within the country as well, and maybe through a consortia type of a, 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 a formation uh, afford this, because the opportunity of number of videos and time of, for recordings um, in terms of Panopto is, is tremendous. And, and we feel as the university alone, I think in the recording time, our license allots for 75,000 hours of, yeah, 75,000 hours of recording time, and we thought we could um, easily share this with our other universities within the country. So yeah, a lot of time, a lot of effort, ensure, uh, in particular um, the use of Panopto. Uh, there's money, you know, involved. It, it is a proprietary software, but as I said, we have had these negotiations and and we How went for first for a reduced price in terms of cost and then for a 50-50 in terms of paying the actual license. And we are now, you know, proactively thinking of how we can sustain this uh, going forward. I hope, Irene, that in terms of the investment there, I've managed to, to address it. And the second one, yes, the first one was how do Hello? you go about uh, buy-in for blended learning um, for lecturer, college and students? And the second question was, how did you ensure that the staff had a common understanding of blended learning at your university? Yes. So the first one is how we ensured buy-in for blended learning. And I just want to get back to the second one. You were saying?
Yeah, okay. Um, well noted. So let me go straight into that in terms of how did we ensure blend in across, you know, all the areas. I, I would like to start there with um, the biggest advantage for us in terms of, you know, after we've researched the idea of the flipped classroom and blended learning in particular as per our policy in the university, is that we managed from day one, as I said, way back in 2013 when we prepared our policy uh, to secure top management buy-in. Uh, by just, you know, continuously advocating for the need for the university because um, in my experience in e-learning, I've been involved in so many capacity building and, you know, conference attendance and sharing of the ideas, but it always remained at that ad hoc level. And we realized unless the university will grant us the opportunity of establishing, you know, a dedicated center where we have sort of the right team and expertise and skill sets to then go out, you know, and advocate for this among our lecturers and, and, and get that buy-in as well, we will go nowhere. So it's because of that, that that we really put a lot of effort in in securing top management buy-in. And when we, when we managed that and top management decided at the end of 2014 that they would want the Center for e-learning and interactive multimedia, um, you know, at least to, to give it a shot in 2015, uh, that's where it all started. So when that happened and our policy was approved, where we already advocated for a blended approach and we got the opportunity of going around from faculty board to faculty board and, you know, symposia and foras, and we advocated for the fact that we are not going to take away your teaching, you know, in terms of the fear from our uh, academic side and we need to lay that to rest in our academics by you know explaining to them that it, it's just to be seen as complementary to what you are already doing within your face-to-face -face environments and that we um, basically will, will train you and will provide you know that hand-holding time to you and will the conducive environment uh, through the fact that there's a dedicated center where they can come to and we can train them and we can assist them even on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So all of that, I, I, I would think, in my opinion, helped us to secure that buy-in uh, for blended learning and also in terms of the common understanding. I mean, um, it's, it's never easy whenever you introduce a new innovation. It's, it's always, you know, tackled with fear and, and panic and all of that. And it was very important for us to make sure, you know, that uh, we are here to assist and, and don't worry about the technical side. Technology should be the least of your fears. That's why we are here. Uh, but you should be focusing Thank still you, on the pedagogic, pedagogy of what you want to deliver. Um, in your teaching and Just learning practices. So um, we advocated for that. It was never easy. The mere fact that we opted for a pilot group who then became our champions, that also worked a lot. And even in our policy, I think there was a link before um, when you shared this with all of us, you would see that we have advocated from the beginning that we'll keep an open mind for working with the willing, uh, you know, and, and, and those early adopters so that it, it won't seem like an imposed or a forced, you know, sort of approach. And, and it's through those champions that then further advocated for this within their respective uh, faculties that we managed to get to this understanding and acceptance of, of, of trying it out within the university. And I also hope that, um, that I've answered that. If not, I'm, I'm more than uh, willing to touch on more in that regard. Okay, good questions. <laughs> now, in terms of what happens when they now actually meet face to face, th this is the part that I've also tried to answer through, you know, that higher order level thinking that we want to trigger in terms of Bloom's taxonomy, uh, in terms of deeper learning, because, um, at the moment, and, and I mean, I, I should maybe perhaps say previously, um, the idea was just, you know, you go to class, um, you go through your PowerPoint presentation, you feel that you've delivered, but you've never had the opportunity to, to assess 
whether you've made the desired or the real impact in terms of your students' learning. And now, what happens during class time is if students access the video recordings before and they've gone through, you know, the, the different slides, whether it's a, a voiceover over the PowerPoints or whether it's the, the actual video clip that they're going through, they now go to class and they have the opportunity to engage in case studies, they engage in quizzes, in practical and active discussions, which, which now really uh, we are hopeful when we will carry out uh, the substantive survey towards the end of the year, we can also start to claim for better performance in that regard. But they're basically now using the class time for, for more interaction and more deeper learning mm -hmm. aspects in, in, instead of just, you know, going to class and listening to the PowerPoint which we will just, you know, Thank run you through Maggie. without sometimes even um, better explanation have, and detail whether, to those bullet you know, points that we are using in that. In terms of your question uh, about the fees, uh, no, there is no difference in fees you know, for, for, for residential the, students the, and distance mode students. And I'll also explain to yeah, you so what was the, so the reason behind this, so um, was that um, the distance mode students receive the um, instructional design study guides, uh, which full-time students, you know, would not have access to. Uh, and therefore, the university decided that uh, the fees will remain the same for the residential students as well as the distance mode students. But then the added value to the distance student is that they'll then get the the um, fully instructional designed study guide, which we are also now trying to move uh, digital and, and want to move slightly away from just the, the print-based uh, study guides. But the fees remain the same. Yeah. No, no, no. This is, you know, like, like it's the norm everywhere. That's why I said it's one of our challenges that in terms of our full-time time students set up the residential students, class sizes still remain fairly big, sometimes 500, 700, you know, for basic, basic mathematics or uh, business mathematics or our core modules like computer literacy or contemporary social issues. Uh, those will be up to a thousand because these are compulsory core modules to all the first year students. But um, interestingly enough, these are also the lecturers that we are assisting in terms of at least trying out alternative assessment, you know, ways uh, for their students. Because with contemporary social issues just last semester, they approached us and we assisted them in terms of um, tests um, on Moodle, uh, automatically graded and randomized in terms of the question bank that we have received from the lecturers. And um, a case in point example is that we've assisted a lecturer with a group of 700 students to take an online test um, in Moodle uh, through this sort of, you know, randomized question bank and so on. And it worked extremely well, you know, in that regard. So uh, yes, there are big class sizes, and then uh, we also, through the use of our learning management system Moodle, we break those up into smaller groups, and you know, lecturers. Each lecturer will then maybe have access to 250 students. Uh, I'll tell you about the challenge that we faced with grading uh, by the mere fact that we've decided to to go online with all our distance students assignment submission in the first semester is that you need to be wary of, you know, competitive eye restrain issues and, 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 and other issues like much, that, Becky, in that lecturers um, will complain about so concentration on the screen, the glare um, from the screen, and things like that. So what we have now decided in a, a strategic um, meeting yeah, that we had a couple of weeks back between the first and the second minutes. semester, we are only starting uh, next week with our second semester. Our we've specifically today. planned um, in, in terms of the acceptable number that we want our tutors and tutor markers to 
perspective on Moodle for marking purposes so that, you know, we won't fall into that trap again that we've moved online, but some would then still prefer to print out and mark the hard copy, uh, while remaining also cognizant that uh, it remained a bit challenging for, for mathematical equations and so on. Now the latex in Moodle is, is fairly enhanced uh, to, to uh, advance in, uh, to assist students in this regard for mathematics and physical science. Um, the students found it difficult to complete the assignments electronically in, in that way using these equations and therefore we had to take an alternative approach there as well. Mm-hmm. <laughs>